You are about to be locked inside the Stingray Show, and coming up on this edition, we are going to be talking with a former War Eagle player who was Mr. Football and the Gatorade Player of the Year in high school. He played two years down at Auburn before transferring to Jacksonville State. Rock Thomas will join us on this edition of the Stingray Show. Guys, we've got a lot to cover with him, so let's get things rocking and rolling. Hi, this is Tim Brando with a reminder. Those of you on Tide 100.9, look out. You're about to feel the buzz of Stingray. This is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. You know, Mark, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you feel that responsibility to pay it forward and give some kid a chance coming up in the ranks, kind of like Tony did for you? Why you think I'm talking to Stingray tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate no, that. No, I'm going to look. No. Hey, Stingray, here's the deal. When you get involved with Texas, it's like getting married to a stripper. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me explain to you. It looks good. It's kind of sexy on, on the surface. Yeah. But then you get the baggage. You get the drama. You get all that eventually comes with it. And that's what you get with Texas. And that's what the Big 12 learned. And Heath, any thoughts on our show moving forward? Hey, to everyone in Tuscaloosa listening here on Tide 100.9, with the Stingray Show, if you don't like it, you better learn to love it because it's the best show going today, baby. Woo! And ladies and gentlemen, with all of that, we want to welcome you inside yet another edition of the Stingray Show. Heath, how are you doing today? Because we have a big-time guest who was a former Auburn player. Man, Stephen, this week is gone going good. I've enjoyed it so far, but I am really looking forward to our next guest. A lot of questions. I want to ask him a lot of things about his professional career, but yes. really, really looking forward to our guest today. And this guy is from Oxford, Alabama, who played at Oxford High School and then went on to play at Auburn University and then transferred out and went to Jacksonville State. He was Mr. Football in the state of Alabama and the Gatorade Player of the Year in high school. Ladies and gentlemen, please help us welcome to the Stingray Show the very talented Auburn player, Rock Thomas. Rock, how are things going with you? Things are going well, Stephen, man. I can't complain. I'm a blessed man. I'm here. I'm happy, man. I'm I'm just blessed to be able to talk to you guys today, man. That's just a blessing. So, so, so Rock, I do want to ask you, what are you up to these days? These days, man, I'm just training still, staying in shape, uh, ready for any opportunity because, honestly, I haven't retired from football, and I still kind of keep my toes in it a little bit. You know, I kind of keep my feet dipped in that water, um, and I'm also training kids nowadays, man. I have my own. Awesome. Uh, performance training program so you know i train kids all throughout the week monday through friday if someone want to train weekends we could do that as well but mainly just that man still kind of staying in that era of my life of you know football i haven't really you know thrown football out yet i'm still loving football still kind of keeping in tune with it rock i wanted to ask you what made you fall in love with football i mean was it one of those things that you were a good athlete they pressured you in doing it at a younger age Tell us how you got into football, how this journey started. Um, honestly, it was just something uh, around my community that was a big thing. So that was one thing. It, it's obviously a lot of factors that would go into it, but that, that would probably be one of the main factors that went into it. It was just a big thing in my community. And also in my family, I would say, um, you know, I, my dad played football. My brothers played football. I got two brothers. They both play football. My cousins, it was just a big thing all around me. So once you're surrounded with that type of thing, I feel like you just kind of feel a little bit of pressure to say, hey, like I can do that too. So let me try to be my best at that. But the thing for me was that at an early age, I was pretty good at it and it was fun for me. And the the reason it was fun uh, 
it was because, you know, it was just relationships. It taught me a lot of things at a young age that, you know, you really can't ask for anyone else to teach you. It's just some things that you got to learn on your own. So mm -hmm. th that was just a big deal for me. And, you know, just playing on and on in years, man, like I, I'd say probably by the time I was playing uh, my second year of Pop Warner, like I was already thinking like, I want to play this at the biggest stage there is. Wow. Biggest lights. And I want the most fans to cheer my name. Like, that's the type of mentality I had at a young age. And that's kind of what I tell my kids, too, that I train now. Like, if you love it now, then you'll love it later. But at some point throughout the journey, you you won't love it as much, you know. But you just you kind of you kind of got to try to get back to that place that you were at a young age and right. just that rhythm back, man. It's almost like forgetting not dancing for a while and you forget how to dance and you go dance and you're like man i don't like this because i can't dance as good as i used to well it's because you haven't danced in so long so you know you just kind of got to get that love back for it, it whatever mm -hmm. it takes really you know it, it, it's, it's just like that it's life so rock i, I do want to go back to your high school days not only did you play football but you all also lettered in basketball but what made you decide to give up basketball for college football? Um, just the fact that I had already seen uh, a lot of success towards reaching my goals in mm -hmm. certain sports. So in basketball, it's a little harder to get an offer in basketball in the ninth, 10th grade, unless you're just some phenom. You know, you got to really be separating yourself from a lot of guys in a lot of states too like you got to kind of your talent has to exceed outside of your state and that's a lot harder to do in basketball so and you know the amount of guys that are getting pulled for basketball is way less than football you know you get a lot of, a lot of guys that go to college and play football but um i honestly um and me and my dad talk about this all the time anytime we get up and talk about sports man i was a basketball fanatic i love basketball i was all for basketball at, at some point in the uh, seventh or sixth or seventh grade, I say, um, I played basketball and I had a game, um, but I had broken my, uh, I broke my right hand maybe like a few weeks before. And I told my dad, I was like, I still want to play. So just let me play. Let's wrap it up and I'll just use my left hand. And I think, uh, I want to say I scored like 54 points in that game and like just doing those type of things. <laughs> you want to be like oh yeah like i love this like you get that drive because you're succeeding like and you know it, at, th at those points of times like it was way easier for me to do those things because i was bigger than some of the kids i was faster than most of the kids and you know it's it's pretty easy to score when you're bigger and you're faster than those kids so those are the type of things that really made me like basketball a lot more but as i grew up and played football i kind of realized that people are going to get bigger it's not going to be that easy to do those type of things you know so kind of had to switch it up a little bit. So Rock, your senior year of high school, you were Mr. Football in the state of Alabama and the Gatorade Player of the Year. And with that, you got the opportunity to play in the Mississippi-Alabama All-Star Game. Please tell us what that experience was like and how players are selected for that All-Star Game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it that was uh, a great experience. Um, that was probably one of the better experiences that I've had as far as um, all-star games and things like that. Um, the Under Armour game was great, too, as well. Yeah. That game was just fun for me because it was a lot of guys that I had known growing up that I got a chance to play with. I got a chance to play with Marlon Humphrey. Um, I think... Um, I think Bo Scarborough was out there, maybe. I, I want to say Bo was there. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of great players out there, man. It was just a, a full field of talent to me, and those are the things that I like because we got to compete a lot, and we just got to talk a lot, talk about our futures, talk about what had went on in our past, in our careers in high school, when we played each other, because I got to play Marlon in high school. Um, I think that was my... I want to say sophomore year. Yeah, that was my sophomore year. We played Hoover in the uh, semifinal, and um, they obviously won that game. But it was those were great experiences, man. Like that just those give you things to talk about later on when you meet up with somebody. If you do get the chance to meet up with them, and 
you know, you just got to enjoy those experiences and really soak up any type of information you can get from those moments. So hold that thought because we are up against our first break. And when we come back, we are going to dive into why you chose to play college football at Auburn. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will be back in a flash with Rock Thomas, the former Auburn Welcome back inside the Sting Race Show. Our guest this evening is Rock Thomas, the former for, former Auburn Tiger and Jacksonville State player as well. And Rock, I do want to ask you, we were talking before the break about the All-Star game there between Mississippi and Alabama, but what was it like for you meeting Gus Malzahn for the very first time? Um, It was amazing, man. Uh, just knowing how much I had looked up to Gus and admired his success on the field and also off the field because he was a heck of a recruiter as well, um, which most people don't give him credit for. He was a heck of a recruiter, even though Gus was a little more closed off it uh, than more than, you know, some of the coaches when it came to recruiting. Um, his style of recruiting was still pretty uh, efficient because he could relate to the kids without, you know, asking them questions or, you know, sometimes you get asked questions and you feel uncomfortable, like you feel like someone's invading your space. But Gus was pretty good at, you know, kind of getting to know you without being invasive sometimes, if that makes sense. Uh, and he was also a pretty funny guy because he wasn't he wasn't ever really trying to be funny, but you know, those type of people usually come off pretty funny because they don't ever know when to stop or they don't ever really know that they're joking because they're just, he's hes pretty nonchalant when it comes to pretty much anything. Like he's just kind of got a chill demeanor. And that's why I like Gus because I was the same way growing up and even in high school, like I was just pretty nonchalant and serious most of the times, but everybody would be like, you're so funny, you're so funny. And I didn't understand that because I'm obviously nonchalant, if that makes sense. Um, yes. But, yeah, Gus was Gus was amazing, man. First time meeting Gus, that was amazing. And I think my first time meeting Gus was – it may have been, um, if I'm not mistaken, it may have been going down to Auburn. But I do remember the most uh, memorable time I, I saw Gus was uh, they had come to – secretly come to a game I played in, um, I want to say Foley uh, – it may have been Foley. It was one of those blue schools I played, the Falcons or something like that. Um, but they showed up to that game, and I kind of got to, you know, swap a few words with them afterwards. You know, just nothing, nothing deep. But you know, Gus is pretty cool, man. I love Gus. He's a great guy. Rock, <clears throat> if you were a high school recruit today, who's one coach you would love to go play for in college? Who's one running back coach you're like, or an offensive coordinator, or just an offense in general? head coach, whatever it might be. Who's one guy that you were just like, I really would like to play for that guy? Um, I'd probably say Lane. I'd probably say Lane Kiffin, man. I, okay. I wanted to – and he had come to my school like early uh, – not early, but uh, a little later in the season uh, to kind of try to flip me. But it was it was a pretty honest uh, visit. He, he came to the school and he said he just had to come see me because, you know uh, – just to show some respect. Like he, he told me, honestly, he was like, if you don't flip or you don't want to come to Bama and, you know, leave Auburn, he was like, I completely understand. Like loyalty is big to me as well. But, you know, he's like, we got a great program, everything like this, obviously still playing his cars and everything like that. But the last thing he said to me was, I just want you to come take an official visit and have fun because most of these kids don't, you know, get to take these official visits and experience these type of things. So, you know, that's one thing I do regret. I wish I would have taken more official visits and, you know, listened to him on that tip because I I, I took one official visit and that was to Auburn. Just, you know, I wanted to be loyal and I wanted to make sure they knew, like, I don't plan on switching. I don't plan on giving any other team attention or the opportunity to, to switch me. So, you know, that was a big thing for me. 
Mm -hmm. So, Rock, what made you decide to play college football there at Auburn? What drew you to the War Eagle? Um, it was a lot of things for me uh, that it boiled down to. One thing was proximity to home. It was close enough to home and far enough from home where my family could come see the games. And, you know, if I needed to go back home, take a visit or anything like that, I could. Because at that point in my life, I, have, I hadn't really ventured off too far from, you know, home, my nest or whatever. So... That was one of the things that factored in for me and the rest as far as football it was a great program the academics were great um when i got there the tutoring and everything and the mentoring that was all excellent that was a one um and the coaches um uh, they had a great coaching staff that had put uh something special together the year prior that i had um gotten to auburn and they had almost won the national championship so that was big to me as well. And I had kind of seen that um, unfold by myself, really, um, with my own eyes, because I had went to plenty of games where I seen like them get behind or they're trailing and then they come back and make a miracle win. I seen I was at pick six game. I was at the uh, the Georgia game where Ricardo Lewis caught the tip pass like those things right there. And those will definitely make you want to go to a school, especially if you're already committed. Like it'll just solidify and kind of you yeah. know, put your feet in the ground. And yeah, those were the things that really stood out to me, man. And it was just a great atmosphere. All the games are always great atmospheres. Rock, I've got to ask you a quick follow up to that. What was it like being in the stands for the kick six? It was ridiculous. And the craziest thing about it was I was with one of my friends. I had brought him down for the game because he hadn't been to a game that year. He, he'd been to a game before, but just not that year, which was a special year. So we're going to the game. We get there and um, obviously not expecting this type of turnout. We're, we're just kind of walking around throughout the stadium because if you had on your lanyard as a player and you were sitting in this, uh, the recruit section, you could kind of walk around, go to the bathroom and walk by the locker room and whatnot. So um, I remember we walk in after they did something and we, we, we're thinking we're going to lose and they're about to kick that field goal. So me and my uh, me and my friend, we walk in and I tell him, I was like, hey, go ahead and use the restroom and um, I'll come back. I'll go back out and I'll come back in whenever you're ready. I was like, I just want to see the end of the game. I walk out and I'm standing in the tunnel and that play happens. He kicks the ball catches it c davis runs down the sideline and i'm standing in the tunnel like oh my goodness there's no way on earth that i'm witnessing this and my my friend runs out and he grabs my neck and i like fall on the ground and everybody's going crazy and all the while this is happening people are trying to pour into the stands and i'm just laying on the ground watching people jump over the over the ladders and over the railings and everything and i was like yeah i'm about to get trampled so i had to hurry up and get up real quick and move out of the way but that was just a crazy experience, man. I've never been in a stadium that was that loud and that many people rushing to the center of the field to celebrate. It was ridiculous, man. That was a one-in-a-lifetime moment. So, Rock, was Chris Davis running towards you, towards your end zone and your tunnel? No, he was running toward away from the end zone, and that's the reason people were – pouring from my side to try to get out so quickly because he was on that end and at that end zone. So they wanted to get down where he was. It was crazy, man. Oh, I bet, man. Loud. I Rock, <clears throat> is there any other moment that comes to mind that is that close of being awesome? I, I'm sure there's nothing better than that, but what's the next closest moment you've had other than that moment? Um, hmm. I would probably have to say, um, even though it doesn't have anything to do with uh, success on my end or success on my team's end, the game that I got in um, at the the next Iron Bowl that next year when I when we went to Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and um, I'm on the sideline and it was it was it's still crazy to me and I still laugh about it, but. Uh, not really funny, but funny to me now. 
sideline <laughs> and uh, me and my teammate Truett, like we always would get on the sideline before the first play started and we would just get hype and slap each other in the head with the towels, you know, just getting crazy. And um, I remember we were doing that and before the game, I remember Coach Lashley came up to me. He was like, hey, we got this play and um, we probably feel like it'll be better if you run it. So we're just going to give it to you. So don't forget, like, if we call this play, like, it's your play. They're calling that play the whole time. I'm slapping him in the head with this towel. and He's slapping me in the head. <laughs> <laughs> so Coach Lashley comes over. He's like, rock, rock, rock. And everybody else starts screaming rock because they're trying to find me. Right. And- Truett grabs me. He turns me around. He's like, he's right here. And he puts me up there, and I'm like, what's up? And he's like, you're playing, you're playing, you're playing, you're playing. So then they put me in and run that play. And I remember Nick Marshall, um, he told me in the huddle, he was like, I think I'm going to hit you. I think you're going to be open, so be ready. I'm going to hit you. And I remember as soon as he threw me the ball and I looked up, I seen nothing but lights, and it was like I died that fast. It was like I died on the field. (laughs) And I couldn't see the ball, so I'm like, that's the play where I fumbled the ball. And I'm like, trying to grab the ball, and then I'm thinking that they called it a forward pass, so incomplete. So I'm running to the sideline, and I'm like, okay, I dodged the bullet. But then I turn around, and um, I forget who it was on on Bama's defense. Um, May have been number 32 or something. They picked the ball up, and they're about to go scoop and score, but he ends up getting tackled by our teammate. And that whole time I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm a goofball. Like, I'm literally (laughs) – I was like, I'm nothing but a goofball. And I go to the sideline, and Coach Malzahn is chewing me out. And Coach Lashley's kind of – he's a little more understanding. And he was like, you didn't didn't see the ball, did you? And I was like, no. And he was like, yeah, because you're being goofy on the sideline. (laughs) I was like, yeah, I won't ever do that again. I won't ever do that again. That's funny. Yeah, that was a funny moment for me, man. It was it was one of those bloopers that I can laugh about nowadays. <laughs> so hold that thought because we are up against yet another break. And when we come back, we are going to dive into your playing career there in Auburn. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will be right back with Rock Tom. It's summertime, West Alabama, and that, of course, means ribs and pulled pork. And if you are craving that, then you need to try the ribs every Saturday at the Coker Market. Saturday from 11 a.m. until 7 p.m. right there off of County Road 140 in Coker, Alabama. They also offer a pulled pork plate and a pulled pork sandwich. Go by the Coker Market today and get your rib fix on with the Coker Market. Welcome back inside the Stingray Show. Our guest this evening is Rock Thomas from Auburn and Rock. In 2014, you got your first action down at Auburn versus San Jose State. What was that experience like for you taking the field for the very first time in an Auburn uniform? Uh, It was surreal. Uh, the, The entire time I was just trying to take in the moment and also do my assignment at the same time, but enjoy it as well. Um, I just remember running onto the field knowing I was at least going to touch the ball one time or at some point throughout that night, I would get to touch the ball and run. Um, So it was just special for me, man. I just tried to enjoy that moment and and soak it in as much as I could, but it was very enjoying um, just being out there with my teammates and, you know, we're, we were, all honestly creating moments for ourselves and it was special you know because a lot of guys that hadn't played in on a college field yet were getting on the field and getting to you know get some reps in so it was good man it was a lot of fun all right so a week later after your first game auburn had to travel to manhattan kansas to play big 12 opponent kansas state what was that experience like of playing Kansas State and especially the crowd and the environment during the game? 
Oh yeah, that was um and I wish I had remembered that when y'all asked me about crazy experiences. That was another crazy experience because Kansas is obviously one of those places where if there's something big going on, a lot of people are gonna show up. So um the game was jam packed. It was people from the point where and you know the football team pulls up hours before the game starts. So mm-hmm. there was a ton of people lined up at the bus, not Auburn fans, Kansas. Mm-hmm. They were for Kansas. So by the time we were done warming up, it was just, it was all them. Like it was all you could hear their fans, their players, their coaches. Like it was barely any Auburn, anything in that stadium. And by the time the game started, uh, we had already known just that it was going to be a hostile environment because they're just the way their stadium was built. And some people have to pay more attention to these things, especially as a player. Like if you just watch how the stadiums are built, you will know just like LSU, those stadiums for the fans are way closer to the players than a lot, a lot of other stadiums will. Mm -hmm. So Kansas theirs was high, but it was like kind of leaned in towards the, the players bench. So if they wanted to lean down and tell you something in your ear, they can. Or if they want to just throw stuff, they can. And they did. <laughs> they did everything that they could, especially towards Nick Marshall, because that was a point in time where he had something going on in his career, and they were yelling, yelling that those things at him, just nasty things, man. And it was crazy. But that's you. You got to live with it. You can't just be like, hey, 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 and walk up there and beat up somebody in the stands. Like you got to, right. got to show him up you know so that's what made it fun and that's that's what he did like he responded as a professional and he went out there balled out just like the rest of the team did but that was one of the most hostile environments i ever been in besides Mississippi State, they're all up there mississippi state is crazy too that's what i'm going to ask you rock what is the craziest environment that you played in uh, you talked about kansas state but what's the one that just tops them all uh without a doubt probably be tuscaloosa uh that one is it just i and i don't know how it is on a regular basis but iron bowl the, everybody gets a little crazier um it's like the serotonin is up or something and everybody is just <laughs> they're there they're there and they're ready to give you a hassle about everything and it's just it's always so loud and you can see the lights flashing in the stands and you can see them doing the wave and doing all this. And it's just a whole bunch of carrying on that distracts you as a opposing team. Every time it's going to distract you. You're not going to be able to keep full focus for four quarters. It's impossible. That's, that's why that is one of the stadiums that is probably the craziest to me. Even um, Texas A&M, that, that doesn't even top it for me because I mean, I guess maybe by the time we played them, it wasn't as, uh, it just wasn't as big on, you know, the fan base. They kind of, you right. know, on a little bit after Johnny football and, you know, they didn't really have anything to come get rowdy for, I guess. So that one was just a little bit of a, uh, probably disappointing for me because I did expect it to be one of those stadiums where, you know, if you call it the 12th man, there needs to be some somebody else here besides the players. So, you know, it was it was okay, but Bama is definitely one of the loudest and the, the most hostile environments to play football in. So, Rock, going back to the 2014 season, a few weeks later after Kansas State, Auburn was ranked second in the country and went to Starkville to take on Dak Prescott and number three, Mississippi State. Talk about that top five showdown there in Starkville versus Mississippi State, please. Game day was there, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Game day was, was there for that game. That was an awesome game. And I actually, um, by the by the time we got to that game, uh, just throughout practice throughout the year, I had earned a lot more respect from the coaches because in our system, you have to just kind of earn the respect of knowing that you know your plays and the details of the work itself. So. I had gotten to that point where I could get the ball more and I did. I got a lot more touches and I was in on more possessions and packages and things like that. So I got to experience it while being in the game instead of just watching. So it was a lot of fun, man. But that game was probably one of the more fast paced games that I played in with Auburn because they kind of wanted to use that fast paced offense to 
either either wear Dak down trying to catch up with us or kind of confuse Dak, you know, it, as if he's getting too many possessions, if that makes sense. That was Gus' mindset. He wanted to kind of wear him out through throwing the ball so much or being out on the field so much, trying to keep up with our fast-paced offense, or he just wanted to make him tired. It was one of the two. And, you know, we probably kind of got him at some point, but, you know, by the end of the game, um, it just didn't turn out in our favor really because, um, you know, it was what it was a shootout. It was one of those showdowns where, you know, if you haven't put enough points on the board by the time the in the fourth quarter where their clock kicks zero, then, you know, you're just the one with, with the short end of the stick. So that's just kind of how that turned out for us. And it was a good learning experience because Dak was an amazing quarterback and he kind of showed us that if we're going to sit back on our, you know, on our heels and kind of take a, take a couple pushes, um, we're going to have to give some too. We're going to have to push back a little bit, you know, especially when it comes to quarterbacks of that caliber. Like they don't really make too many mistakes and they're trying to put the ball in the end zone. That's mm -hmm. two more times than not. So rock, I do want to ask you about that game. Auburn comes out and the first two offensive plays, two turnovers. He had an interception that led to a Mississippi State touchdown. Then you come back and get the ball again, and you fumble it, giving it right back to Mississippi State. Talk about the emotion on the sidelines of going two plays, two turnovers, please. Yeah, um, after those things happen and you're playing a team like that, you either are going to have someone that is a leader steps up and says, hey, we got to get this back on track and we're not going to look back at what just happened. We're just going to go forward from here. And mm -hmm. but or you can have someone who is supposed to be the leader that doesn't step up and just watches it happen. And that's going to be self-destruction pretty much. But we never had anything like that, man. We always had someone and especially like Nick Marshall and Duke Williams and people like that, like they always came up and stepped up and was like, hey, like, let's let's get this rolling. Like, forget what we just did. Like, let's let's just get this rolling. No matter who it was, if even if it was the one who fumbled, like if they were wanted to be the voice, like, hey, let's get it right. We would know like, hey, they're trying to, you know, own up to their mistakes and they want to do better from this point on. So let's listen to them and let's get on that boat with them. But that's just kind of how that was and how the move was on the sideline. And but you, you can really tell everybody's human. You could tell when people are like down and thinking about what just happened, you know, instead of trying to figure out what they could do to, you know, kind of make that seem like it didn't happen in a sense. But we didn't really ever have a problem with anyone stepping up and pushing us in the right direction. It was always some type of leadership going on. So, Rock, hold that thought because we're up against yet another break. And when we come back, we are going to dive into the 2015 season. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will be right back. How would you guys like to try the new mocktails at Strange Brew Coffee House? They have a new summer drink menu, which includes a mule, a marg, or a mojito. Now, the mojito is sparkling mint and a lime refresher. Now, you can find Strange Brew Coffee House at the University of Alabama Strip right there on University Boulevard. Go by there today for some of their summer drink menus, which includes mocktail right now at Strange Brew Coffee House. Welcome back, SEC fans. You're listening to the Stingray Show. I'm Heath Hopkins along with Stingray, Stephen Ray, and today our very special guest, Rock Thomas. And Rock's been telling us about his time there at Auburn. Rock, I want to touch real quick uh, about your playing days in the NFL. You know, I, we hear it all the time. We hear it every single year. They talk about how the game is so much faster at the NFL level. Now, the SEC, everyone keeps talking about, oh, they're so fast, they're so fast. But, you know, we've had other people on the show, I've asked this question, and they said, you can't believe how fast the game is at the NFL. 
what was that like for you adapting to that NFL speed? Um, it was a big change for me. It was a really big change because just like people say, man, a lot of people will be like, well, the SEC is just like the NFL. You know, it's the closest thing in the NFL. It's the closest, but right. nobody's telling you how far away from it it really is in comparison. Like, mm-hmm. it, it's a huge difference. It's a way, way, way bigger bigger game, man, and people don't really get that. But um, just even at practice, you, you kind of see those guys running around, you know, maybe your first day out or whatever it may be, and you get to see those guys who have been there for – two, three years plus, you know, um, and you just realize that this is not the speed we are used to Mm -hmm. level in college, you know, for practice, these guys are running, they're, they're probably giving you 95% at practice when usually, you know, people may give 75, you know, 80, 90 tops, but those guys are trying to give a hundred percent every play just so that it transforms into the game. And when the game comes, they're even faster. They're even faster, man, because people don't realize that these are grown men. Most of them have kids. It's their job. And it's probably, it's probably their only occupation that it's probably all they do. They just play football. They don't mm-hmm. have a business on the side, especially if it's their first year in football, they don't have a business on the side and that's earning them income every week or every month. So, this guy's trying to get his money and he's trying to get his money right now. He's trying to get it. So, you know, there's a lot of guys who are competing in. Those are the things that probably push them to go faster, you know, because it's just at a, it's at a level where, you know, you have, you, it's expected of you, you know, with all those things that go into it, you know, the lights shining on you, there's thousands of people watching the game. It's on TV. Your, your favorite fans probably watching, your kids are watching, your mom and dad are watching, everybody can see. So who who wouldn't want to be their best at that stage? So that's probably one of the main things to me that drives guys like that to, you know, play at such a faster pace and a faster level than they did in college. What position group was way too fast for you when you first got to the NFL? Was it the linebackers? Was it the D linemen? Was it the secondary? What was it for you that were like, oh my gosh, these guys? Yeah, yeah. Most people would if if I hadn't answered yet, most people would be like, oh, you probably say the the corners or the DBs or whatever. They're probably way too fast for you, huh? And I would be like, no, I would say the defensive linemen because they're mm-hmm. and they're fast. Mm-hmm. Put that combination together, it's a lot harder of a hit or collision, whatever it may be, than say you running into a db a db doesn't like contact anyway everybody knows that a db would rather tackle your legs if anything so <laughs> when you run up against one of those big six six three forty d linemen who are built up like they don't eat no meat they just eat veggies and lift weight all day they look really lean like that mm-hmm. like the neil hunter he when somebody like that runs up on you and you don't have anywhere to cut and you just have to go towards them. Yeah. Then you'll think about <laughs> start thinking about up in your speed. All right. Fun question. What was your welcome to the sec moment? Oh man. It was when, um, gosh, I told my dad this the other day. It was when Ruben Foster, everybody knows Ruben Foster. Right. He didn't even tackle me. He hit me with his arm right here. Mm-hmm. Hit me with that part like of the clothesline. Yeah. And I was kind of going out towards the sideline and Ruben Foster just comes over and uh, it wasn't even, I watched it on film again and he didn't even try to, he didn't try to hit me that hard. I kind of <laughs> went, kind of hit to the side and I fell and hit my head on the, on the, on the turf. And I remember my teammates coming to pick me up and I was like, get off me. I'm all right. I didn't want nobody to know like right. Foster just got the best of me and I didn't even realize it just yet. <laughs> <laughs> what was your welcome to the NFL moment? Oh man. That one, that one was when uh, I was playing the Cardinals and we were at home. And um, I remember John Filippo, he had put in his play for me and Dalvin and it was kind of like a pitch screen, but the, it was a, it was a, um, a formation. It was kind of like a two back formation. One back goes out the other way and kind of like a misdirection and the other back goes this way and cuts up and, QB kind of tosses in the ball on like a little screenplay. 
and I was the screen catcher on that play. And they ended up um, taking Dalvin out to get a breather, and we just ran that play the next play. And, man, I forget who it was. Uh, who were you playing? Uh, the Cardinals. This is when okay. the guy, I forget his name, um, he went to the Raiders as well. He was one of the DNs. He was pe- pretty good, but uh, I forget his name. But I remember he kind of – he did one of the craziest moves on our on our tackle. He was coming down, coming down feel like this. Right. He spun out to get back to me, and I'm all the way on that side of the field. He spun out to get back to me. <laughs> And I'm watching this on film like this mother. How did he do that? Right. Back around and he just blindsides me. He creeps up from behind one of our linemen and just blindsides me, man. And I did not like I wanted to lay there. But then I was like, I'm on TV. Let's get up. Right. Right. (laughs) To just lay here. But that was definitely my welcome to the NFL moment. Before that, I hadn't really got too many touches or, you know, I didn't really get, um, I didn't really get hit preseason, really, because um, we had a lot of great runs in preseason that were set up for us to succeed and kind of showcase our talents. Uh, but once we got into the season, we were a little more experimental and doing things that we wanted to see would work. And, you know, that one. You mentioned something right there, preseason. There's obviously some guys there. They just signed a contract. They're not worried about it. The intensity is not there for those preseason games. But there's some guys there that are trying to make the the club. Are right. those guys just dogs out there? And are, are do you have to watch those guys a little bit extra? Like, man, this guy's trying to make the club here. This no name guy's trying to, you yeah. know, or this guy's trying to get one more contract in. Mm-hmm. It, what is it like mindset? What do they tell you before a preseason game? about those guys um just like you said just keep a closer eye on those guys and and watch out for them especially if you're a player that you know uh everybody it's 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 a complicated thing when you're talking about like what happens like on the inside of football because the coaches are a little more like they're kind of sneaky when it comes to like telling people things like they won't tell every player what they're telling right players so you know, if a coach tells you, like, hey, like, I need you to chill out. Like, we, we're trying to, you know, keep you, you know, around. We don't really want you to get hurt or anything like that. So if they tell you something like that and then they come and tell you about one of those guys that you got to watch out for, then you should probably kind of hunker it down a little bit and, you know, kind of gauge those guys and see how they're going. Like, maybe not, especially in preseason, maybe not just go all out first play and second play, just kind of – you know, get your feet wet a little bit and kind of see what's going on. Are those guys chilling and just trying to get some reps in and, you know, keep some film out? Or are they trying to kill somebody today? And mm-hmm. I like real. That's kind of what you got to watch out for. And most of the times those guys are pretty professional. They're not like running around like wild animals. There are some guys that do that and they hurt a lot of people. But more times than not, man, it's a lot of professionals running around trying to take care of each other and, you know, sometimes things happen, but more time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you were talking about uh, uh, those guys and, and guys trying to hurt you and this and that. Let's go to the other side of that. Trash talkers. Mm-hmm. Of all your time, who has been the biggest trash talker you've come across, whether that be in the NFL, the SEC, high school, whatever, practice there at Auburn? Who's the biggest trash talker you ever came across? And what is something funny that he said? Oh, man. Let me think on this one. I know uh, – I may not remember off the top of my head anything he said. And you can share more than one. You can spit three or four out if you want to. One of my guys uh, – and I played with him in high school, Trey Elston. He played at Ole Miss. He went on to play, yeah. with, play with the Saints, the Dolphins, and et cetera, uh, the Bills. Um, he is probably one of the best – trash talkers that I know because he's not a trash talker where he just says things. The things he says are more than likely they, they're probably true or there's some things that, you know, he's doing and dug up to get under your skin. Like, right. So he's oh, looking at ex-girlfriends or yeah, yep. those kind of things. Okay. Yep. So he'll 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 be on the field. He'll he might say things like, "Where's your girl at? Where's your girl at, huh? Where's your girl at? You on the field? Where's your girl at? Anything like that, man. He'll pick at you and he'll get a for sure. But 
He's probably one of the best people I know at trash talking. Okay. So, Rock, unfortunately, all right, here we go. So, guys, I am back. I apologize for the technical difficulties there, and we were up against yet another break, and when we come back, we are going to finish up this interview with Rock Thomas. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to The Stingray Show. We will be right back to finish it up. Welcome back. Instead of our final segment right here on the Stingray Show, our guest this evening is Rock Thomas, the former Auburn player and as well as the Jacksonville State player. And Rock, in 2015, Auburn opened up in Atlanta for a neutral site game versus Louisville. What was that experience like of opening up the first game of the season in a neutral site? That game was awesome, man. It was a great experience. Um, Probably one of the um, better games, you know, season openers that I've been in. Uh, Just due to the fact that it was at a neutral site as well. So there was a lot of people there. It was the attendance was great. Um, Atmosphere was wild. Uh, Louisville fans are pretty fun to be around, too. Um, That game was a little frustrating with for me at the beginning because I, I had hurt my foot and man, I was training so hard for that game the whole the all summer and man, spring and everything like that. I was just putting in a lot of work and it was just a little disappointing that I had gotten hurt so early on and um but it ended up being something that, you know, I needed to take care of at the time and not really worried about not playing in that game at, at, yes. at that Time. So, you know, it ended up working out and I still ended up enjoying myself, man. It was a great experience because I hadn't known who Lamar Jackson was yet. And he hadn't he hadn't gotten put in the game. I don't think he started the game. I think he got put in towards the end of the game when they were struggling and he brought them back into the game single handedly. I'm talking running all over our defense, throwing all over our defense, scrambling all over our defense, just making it difficult for us for the, that entire game. And that's not something we foreseen before the game. We didn't think that they're going to put in this backup quarterback and he's going to explode on us, you know. So that was just a good experience, man. So, Rock, at the end of the 2015 season, you decided to transfer from Auburn. What went into that decision for you to leave Auburn after just two seasons? Um, honestly, it was just, uh, a matter of, I would say for me, a matter of patience as far as things that I was looking for in my career. Like I had kind of gotten to a point where I didn't want to keep waiting around to, you know, um, just be one of those guys where the offense is not necessarily based around me, but I'm one of the key factors and, I had felt like I could do a lot of things that, you know, the offense needed done. Um, And by the time uh, we had gotten around the spring, I was getting moved around to slot receiver and stuff. And as I had told people and not people being outsiders, as I had told the coaches, I was like, I don't have any problem playing any different position that the offense needs to be played. I will play tackle if I need to play tackle, but it's just a matter of me being utilized. If I'm just here, you know, I don't want to just be one of those guys that get put to the side and kind of fade away. And it was probably more so not paranoia, but anxiety of being done like that, you know? So I just kind of took matters into my own hands and kind of dug around to see what I should do. And, you know, it wasn't a decision that I was just like, oh yeah, I'm just going to leave one day. It was a decision that was kind of, um, formed over the course of a year where me and the coaches were in talks and just trying to figure out what was best for me because that's what they wanted and that's what I wanted. You know, at no point in time did I feel like the coaches were trying to do me wrong or, you know, um, I never felt like they had any ill intent behind anything they were doing. I just felt like I was stuck in a bad situation where these coaches have to figure out 
where to put the best players and we have a ton of good players i feel like we were just kind of overloading ourselves with talent in the same areas too much i feel and you know there's no problem with that it you just got to learn how to use all of that and you know without without someone feeling like left out i want to say yeah so rock i've got two questions left for you and then we'll let you get out of here the first one is looking back at your entire career whether it be auburn jacksonville state or the nfl which game that you played in means the most to you and why um i would probably say uh it would probably either be entire career probably be a tie between my first game in the nfl or my first game ever playing football period it, it, it it's got to be a tie between those two because that's when i found the love for the game and mm -hmm. the beginning and then the last one was me seeing that all the things that i did was to prepare myself for this moment to you know be happy in this moment instead of being worried in a moment because i know a lot of players who go to to the nfl and they play their first game preseason or not and they're just all nervous man they don't really right play. they're all anxious and they don't get to have fun and that was big for me to just have fun because what a lot of people don't know is like at that point in my career i wasn't really i won't say i didn't want to play football i would say that i just didn't know why i was still playing football and i didn't really I didn't really know how to, you know, deal with that in my head. So I just kind of started talking to people around, you know, the facility and everything. I'm with the Vikings at this point. So uh, I've never told anybody this on live, but I've told people and I don't care to tell anybody. But it was a point in time at the Vikings where I was walking and it may have been the second or third practice or whatever. We're in fall camp. No, this was at the end of fall camp, actually. And this is when we're about to figure out who made the team. And I remember we're getting out, getting ready to go to practice. And one day I just felt super overwhelmed. Like it's a lot going to all those meetings and stuff. I just felt super overwhelmed and super anxious, man. And I just didn't know what to do. So I had mm -hmm. the coach's number. I had, um, I had Zim's number. So I was going to call Zim and I just stepped out in the hallway and I was going to call Zim and tell him like, I don't think I want to really play anymore, but I don't want to, I don't want to make that decision today. You know, I just kind of want to talk to you and see what advice you have for me. But I remember I seen as I was calling him, he was walking towards me and I just put the phone down and I went out to practice. And then the next day I made the team. So I just tell people all the time, like, don't really get in the, the moment of not being stuck in the moment of not knowing what to do. If you want to ask for help, always go ask for help. And if you don't really know, just kind of just wait it out. Just, you know, just float in the water a little bit and see where the current takes you. So that's one of the biggest things for me. And I feel like that that's what led up to that moment for me to be able to go out on the field and smile and score touchdowns and have fun again. And I feel like I hadn't done that a while in college. Like I was just being a lot, a lot more serious than I was. And then I got back in the NFL and it was fun for me again. So those things were for me. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. No matter what you do, that is excellent advice. Mm -hmm. So, Rock, finally, what is your favorite Coach Malzahn story that you enjoy telling to people? Um, my favorite Gus Malzahn. Uh, I probably got two. The first one would be um when Gus invited us all over to his house. And that's a, that's something that a lot of people don't know about Gus. He's, he's, a, he's just like I said earlier, he's kind of an introvert. I want to say, I don't really know. I don't, I haven't diagnosed him or he didn't know anything about that, but I feel like he's an introvert and he's one of those people who are kind of closed off and have been closed off for a majority of their lives. And he had finally invited us over to his house for like a little, he started doing like an annual team gathering and he would invite the players over to fish and swim and cook out and everything. And he had invited us over and 
um, that was probably the first day he kind of let his hair down with us and relaxed. And, you know, he jumped in the pool and there was really nobody in the pool. He started it off. He, he jumped in the pool and everybody else started jumping in the pool. Um, and we just all started talking, man. We just all started bonding. And uh, I don't remember the story Gus told us, but I remember he had everybody in tears. It was so funny, man. It was some story about his childhood and he had got hit in the helmet with a football or something and it got stuck right there. But I don't <laughs> Exactly, but man, it was just him unwinding for me, man, and you know, just kind of chilling around us and not being such a coach always, and you know, just kind of showing us that you know, um, I can be just like you guys and you know, around you guys. You know, I don't always have to be uptight and serious. We and we can have fun, and that's what made people want to play for him, man. Like at that point, like it, it made a lot of guys realize that you know we got a great coach and you know we can really open up to him and kind of lay it all out for him. He's not always wearing a sun visor, is he? <laughs> he is half of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Rock, I got a fun question. We'll, we'll wrap up on this one. When you were being recruited, what mm-hmm. is the worst recruiting pitch that you heard? Like, wh- like, did a coach say something like, man, are, are you serious? Or was it just something so far-fetched? Like, come on, man. I mean, what is the worst recruiting pitch that you received back mm. during your recruiting days? I'd probably say um, a school came to me and this school is very popular for their uniforms and their flashiness with their colors and how many uniforms they wear. I'm pretty sure you guys will pick up what I'm talking about by the end of this. So uh, it sounds like they're out in the West Coast. On the West Coast. And okay, yeah, yeah. They, um, they came to the school, and at my school, when the coaches came, they would usually come, yep, they would usually come in the morning, or they would come right around lunchtime. So anytime around 11 to, like, 12-ish, 2.30, 2.30 being the latest, that's the latest they would come because we'd get out of school around 3. Um. So they came around lunchtime and they pulled me out of lunch and I go to the field house and my coach is like, school's here to see you or whatever. And I go in the room. They have a big stack of shoes lined up all over the table. And coach starts talking to me and he was like, man, you know, I I like your film or whatever. And I like you a lot. We really could use you in the offense or whatever. And um, he looks at me and he was like, if you come there, all this could be yours. And I just look at them and I was like, you think I'm going to be sold on six pairs of shoes for, for, for to put four years of my life into your program? You think I'm going to be sold off six pairs of shoes? And I didn't say this out loud, but he read my look and he was like, there's more. I got more. And I looked and I looked at my coach and I just looked around and I was like, you know, I was like, to be honest, what is, what is, uh, your academic program, I'm, I'm, I'm messing with him at this point. I'm like, no, like what's, what's the academics about? Like, you know, what, you know, um, I like art and I do graphic design. So like, what type of major could I do with that at your school? And he was like, ah, you don't want to care about that. And that's when I I got him. I was like, okay. I was like, if I don't want to care about school, then I'm not going to come there. And he was like, no, I don't mean it like that. I don't mean it like that, but shoes, shoes, we can, we can get more shoes. We can always get more shoes. And I was like, dude, are you, do you only know about shoes? Is that it? Like, this is the worst pitch anybody has ever given to me. And I've, I've been given some bad pitches, school talking about food. And I'm like, dude, tell me what I can really benefit from this, from, right. from coming to your school. But no, nah, nobody ever really like it's it's probably been some other guys probably have better stories as far as that. But when it came to me, I was really just I probably say I was goofy with it in a sense to to mess with the coaches to kind of see where their head was really at. And mm-hmm. I think that threw a lot of coaches off. And the next day, Cal had came to my school and uh, the running back coach, uh, I forget he's some light skinned dude. I forget his name. But he laughed about it with me, and he was like, "Hey, I got some shoes," and I just bust out laughing. And he was like, "Yeah." <laughs> he was like, "I heard, I heard the school came yesterday, man, and they were trying to offer you shoes and everything." And I was like, "Yeah, it was a bust. It was a big bust." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, well, let's just say you're not a Nike fan, right? 
Yeah, man. I'm like, dude, I, I like Nike, but dude, you got to offer me a little more than some Nike, dog. <laughs> so, Rock, I do want to ask you this. In parting, as we leave here this evening, what was your welcome to the SEC moment for you? Oh, yeah. Uh, the 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 hit with uh, old Ruben Foster, man, and I told him about it earlier. He, uh, I asked that question, Stephen. Why don't you ask him another question? Oh, you, you, you didn't tell me that, dude. I'm sorry. I asked him his welcome to the NFL on SEC moment. I did. Okay. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. You want to ask him anything else or wrap up? So, Rock, in parting, I do want to ask you this because you were still dialed in with the Auburn program. Briefly give us your thoughts on how you think Auburn is going to do in the 2024 college football season. Man, I think they're going to do pretty good. I think they got a great receiving core. I haven't really followed too much. Um, It's been about a month or so as far as the quarterback things. I don't really know where they're at on the quarterback situation. Um, But I think they're going to be pretty good, man. They've Last year they showed um, – they show some signs of being a great contending team. And I feel like if they fix uh, just a couple of pieces, man, it's nothing that they need to make drastic changes about. They just need to fix a couple of hiccups and, you know, sew a couple of holes up and the dress will be good as new. I feel like, and I feel like they just need to keep that mindset that they are good and they can compete with uh, a lot of other teams. Cause with the, the way the NCAA is now, I feel like the transfer portal has made it easier for teams to be contenders and to compete yeah. because these guys can jump to another school the next year if they see that that school had some some success the last year prior. Uh, so I feel like it's a lot easier nowadays for them to, you know, get good just based off how they were last year. And I feel like they got a great receiving core. I think they got a lot of the returners on defense that are going to help out. So I think they'll do pretty good, man. I think they'll do pretty good this year. So, Rock, go ahead. The floor is all of all yours. Any final words that you want to say about your career down there at Auburn and, of course, at Jacksonville State? No, man, nothing really. Just I had the most fun of my life at those two places. and. Um, as something that I never got to do when I did leave Auburn was, you know, most people, they'll write a letter or whatever. But, you know, for me, it was just a point in my life where I was just really trying to take care of myself. And I had to realize that it was more about me than it was about pleasing anybody else, which that's something that a lot of athletes get caught up in. And yeah, they're trying to please a lot of other people. But at the end of the day, there's... It's just you and who's there for you, you know, when you need them. So um, it was great, man. I, I, I enjoy every bit of Auburn. I made lifelong friends. I still talk to all my teammates from Auburn. Sean White just wrote me the other day and we talked. Um, you know, it's it's just something that, you know, you don't ever really get rid of. You don't ever really get rid of those relationships you make, those bonds you make. And, you know, it's special. and for any player that is having to decide on a change in their life or make a transition, I recommend that you do what, you know, your heart's telling you to do and what's best for you. You know, whether you got to sit down and think for a month or a week about what the best decision is for you, you know, you just got to figure that out yourself. Nobody else can tell you that. And, you know, that's what it's all about. It's all about, you know, if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't, you know, go out and score touchdowns and make fans roar in the stands. You can't do that if you're not well, especially if you're not taking care of your mental, if you're not taking care of your physical, and all those things go hand in hand. So, you know, that's what the fans love. They love somebody that's coming out and they're a beast and they're dominating and, you know, they're making making the scoreboard light up. That's just what it's all about. So, Rock, look, thank you for saying that. And we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your summer. And we will definitely catch up with you down the road to get your take on how Auburn is doing this season. Sir, thank you very much. Rock, thank you. Take care. Appreciate y'all. 
So, Heath, that was yet another great show, great interview, and very inspiring there from Rock Thomas, the former Auburn and Jacksonville State player. We really do want to thank him for joining us. You know, we've had a lot of former players on the show, but Rock seems like he's got all of his stuff together. You know, he, yeah. he seems like he's got a plan. You know, he talked about his physical health. He's talked about his mental health. He talked about, you know, having fun playing football, not trying to please everybody and getting caught up in all that. And Rock just seems like he is very wise beyond his years. And I think that's going to pay off for him on or off the football field, no matter what he chooses to do. I think that's really going to go far for him. So, Heath, on that note, we've got to sign off here on the Stingray Show. We will be back tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. with yet another Stingray Show. 